greatest sufferings and calamities for humanity when the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala departed from this world physically and his departure was a great loss but alhamdulillah we have today what Allah has revealed to the Prophet and we also have today the way Rasulullah exemplified that message. So today, inshallah, I want to share with you some aspects of the conduct of Rasulullah and we are going inshallah to reflect on a hadith from someone who spent his life whether it be at the time that he was a child or a teenager or an adult with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that is Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi sallam you know that Amir al-Mu'mineen even as a child was under the care and education of the Prophet he was brought up by the Prophet and the house of the Prophet and he has the best view about the Prophet because he has spent more time with the Prophet than anyone else <coughs> and the Prophet shared with him his ideas even things that he didn't say to the public and also he had that caliber that Rasulullah told him you see what I see and you hear what I hear except that last of the Nabi and you are a prophet so that is Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam so we want to listen to Amirul Mu'mineen when he describes the Prophet. But who is mentioning this? It's interesting. Imam Hassan alayhi salam had asked someone called Hind to describe Rasulullah. And then he says he shared this with Imam Hussein alayhi salam later, and Imam Hussein said he had actually had this and more than this from Amirul Mu'minin alayhi salam. And this is mentioned in many of our books, and this is also mentioned by our Sunni brothers. So if you go to Sunni sources, you see that they quote this from Amirul Mu'minin from Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So it's a very uh, you know, one of those exceptional cases that you find from Sunni and Shia sources the same thing. So, <coughs> Imam Hassan alayhi salam says, I asked Hand about, this Hand is not that woman, Hand is a man. I asked about the Prophet Madhal al-Nabi wa makhrajihi wa majlisihi wa shakrihi how the Prophet was spending his time and behaving at home and outside how was his gathering and how was his appearance and he described for me then Imam Hussain alayhi salam told Imam Hassan Sa'altu Abi alayhi salam. I also asked my father, Amirul Mu'mineen, about 
different aspects of the life of the Prophet. This is very beautiful hadith. It's about a page. And I will try to refer to some examples of different sections. So, first, an madkhala Rasulullah. Imam Hussein alayhi salam says, I asked my father, Amir al Mu'minin, to describe for me how was Rasulullah at home when he was going inside. So, Amir al Mu'minin said, Kana. دخوله لنفسه معظونا له في ذلك فإذا أوى إلى منزله جزء دخوله ثلاثة أجزاء جزءا لله وجزءا لأهله وجزءا لنفسه رسول الله of course like other people he had his personal private also life he was not always in masjid or in the public. Although there were occasions that Rasulullah was doing a takaf, he was not going home, or you know, he was in trip, or he was in uh, you know, some mission. But he had his personal life and private life as well. But he was dividing his personal time into three. Jews and Dillah. Part of it still was for ibadah, because you know that Islamically we are very much encouraged to do our obligatory salat in the masjid, in congregation, but also do your nawafil at home. You must not do everything in masjid, because your household also should be benefiting from your ibadah. So, he was doing part of his ibadah in masjid, part of his ibadah reflections, recitations at home. So, this was part of his time at home. Part of his time was for ahlihi, for his family. So, this is also important a lesson for me and for all of us that you should allocate some time also for your family. Normally, the time that we have for family is when we don't have anything else to do. <laughs> if I have nothing else to do, I am with the family. But <laughs> Rasulullah had planned, had allocated some time to his family. That is the time that he would not do ibadah. That is the time that he would not do anything else for the family. And part of his time was for himself. But what is interesting, Then the time that he had for himself, he was dividing between himself and people. Because some people were not waiting for Rasulullah to come outside. They wanted to see him in his home. Either there was something urgent or they were not patient for different reasons. People sometimes used to go and meet Rasulullah in his house. So Rasulullah was not giving from the time of Ibadah. He was not giving from the time of the family. He was giving from his personal time. So he had to sleep less. He had to rest less. It's a bit beautiful. You cannot sacrifice what belongs to your family. You can put more pressure on yourself and help people. It's very beautiful. Then Amir al salam explains how Rasulullah was dealing with the people who had hajat and he had a policy how to deal with the people who had one hajat or two hajat or more. And also Rasulullah used to say to people that whoever has some need, 
some haja, and he's not able to tell me, you should tell me about their needs. أَبْلِغُونِ حَاجَةَ مَنْ لَا يَقْدِرُ عَلَىٰ إِبْلَاغِ حَاجَةِهِ Not only he was not hiding himself from people and was not stopping people to bring their haja to him, he was actually asking people, if you know someone who has haja and cannot reach me or is you know, feeling embarrassed or shy to tell me, you inform me about their heart. This is when the leader, when someone who has the power or ability to help people, has love, wants to help. And he said, it's a very beautiful, very great Peshara. فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ أَبْلَغَ سُلْطَانًا حَاجَةً مَنْ لَا يَقْدِرُ عَلَىٰ إِبْلَاغِهَا Whoever helps someone who has a haja, who is not able to take his haja to the one who has power, head of a state, or I don't know, can be a king, a president, a minister, someone who has some authority, and cannot take his own haja and report and you know ask for help. If you help him to raise this issue to that person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would strengthen his feet on the day of judgment, would not fall on the bridge of Sarat. Of course, if you can help yourself, you can help it. It's not that you, know, you can do something, you don't do it, you know, everyone you know, is sending to the leadership. What can the leader do if so many people take their hajar? But sometimes there are some issues that no one else can help. Something that is bigger than your power. You must hear use your access, your reputation, the trust that is in you to help other people. I read about one of ulama who passed away recently, I mean about a few years ago, that he was very respected by Ayatollah al-Uzma Buru Jirdi. You know Ayatollah al-Uzma Buru Jirdi? was in the last stage of his life, almost the only Shia manager. And he was very, mashallah, established, very influential, very much loved and supported by people. So this Alim, who was very respected by Ayatollah, who himself was a mujtahid, he had sometimes financial needs, but he was never mentioning to Ayatollah Burjirdi. But whenever he knew some talabe had problems, he was going and asking Ayatollah Burjirdi, and he was helping them because of his intercession, because of him informing Ayatollah Burjirdi, but he never asked for himself. This is beautiful. But some of us say, you know, I cannot ask all the time this person, so let's keep it for myself. I only mention my own hajat. <laughs> I don't mention hajat of anyone else. But if you are a true mu'min, you would be more hesitant to ask for yourself, but with honor and dignity, you can ask for other people. And inshallah, Allah will help you. So Rasulullah says, Man ablaga. Sultanan Hajatan Man La Yaqdir Ala Iblaqha. Whoever makes sure that someone's Hajat reaches Sultan. Sultan doesn't mean king, means someone has authority. Someone who has no way to reach the one who has authority. You help him with raising this issue. Allah strengthen and make firm 
your feet on the day of judgment. So Rasulullah was asking people, bring a hajat of people to me. So, in this section, Amir al muminin explains how Rasulullah was spending his time at home. Then, Imam Hussain alayhi salam says, فَسَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ مَخْرَجِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ when Rasulullah was coming out, Khuruj, Makhraj is Master Mimi, means Khuruj. When Rasulullah was coming out, what was he doing? Amir al Mu'minin says, Khan sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi yakhzun lisana. This is a great quality of Rasulullah and it is so important that Amir al-Mu'minin mentions this at the first. The fact that Amir al-Mu'minin picks up this and mentions it at the beginning shows how important it is. It says Rasulullah used to watch his words and would not say anything which was not relevant to him, which was not related to him. Amma, yani, only things which were related to him and he had to deal with them, he was hoping. So he was not saying anything haram, definitely, but he was not also saying anything which is not necessary. Talking about people's business, talking about people's lives, no. We have many hadiths. Tarkul kalam fi ma la yani. When something doesn't concern you, it's not important for you, you should not talk about it. So, this is the very first thing that Amir al Mu'minin says about the public life of the Prophet. Allah knows. How much we harm ourselves and people through our words. And fortunately or unfortunately, because sometimes can be fortunate, sometimes can be unfortunate. It's very easy to talk. In few minutes, we can say hundreds of words. In few minutes, we can break lots of relations. Or we can improve. This is the easiest, maybe, part of the body to move your tongue. Therefore, it's more difficult to control. Anything which is easier to move, then it's more difficult to control. So we have to be very careful about what we say. May Allah be with all of us. One of the things that Rasulullah was very concerned about was to do something to bring people closer to each other. And not to divide them, not to separate them. You can make people closer to each other. You can bring unity. You can bring love. You can bring trust. Or you can bring suspicion and hostility and enmity and separation. Which one do you want to choose? Do you want to act like Shaitan that was dividing people, Pharaoh dividing people, all the tyrants try to divide, or do you want to do something godly? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brings unity, reconciles between hearts. Another thing is, and this is one of the wise policies of Rasulullah. Yukarremu or yukarremu, both of them are correct. Karima kull qawmin. Wa yuballihe alayhe. Whenever Rasulullah was dealing with some people, for example, a tribe, or another country, another state, or a religious community, and 
they had some people that they were honoring, they were respecting. Unfortunately, people who have ungodly character, don't worry what they do, they target people who are respected. So if they belong to another tribe, another nation, another faith community, whatever, they see who was more influential, more respected, who was receiving more honoring from people, they try to dismiss. But Rasulullah was opposite. If anyone was Karim of Oman, he was honored by some people, even Mushrikeen. Suppose there was a city, there was a group of people who were fighting and then they submitted themselves. Rasulullah was not quickly getting rid of those who were honored and had position. Rasulullah actually was putting them in position and honoring them. Look at the way Rasulullah, for example, treated son of Hatam and Ta'i. The way even Rasulullah treated Abu Sufyan. In the conquest of Mecca, one of the safe places was to be in Masjid al-Haram to be in their own homes, or to be in the house of Abu Sufyan. Rasulullah didn't make the orders upside down. This is not wise, and this is not honor, that if someone in his own community, his own people, was very respected, we try to change everything. Then what happens is, then Le'am and mean people may take over. Either you create a chaos or anarchy or people who are new to power and money and fame, they take over. It's very important. You must not create chaos or anarchy when you deal with other people. As much as possible, try to use the respect and honor and the system that they have, as much as possible, of course. Yukrimu or yukarimu karima kulla qawman wa yuvallihi alayhim and was giving velaya to him over the people. It's a head of a tribe. Okay, you are not Muslim and you are fighting Muslims. Now you are with us, okay. You remain in leadership. You are head of this tribe. You remain in leadership. This is karama of the Prophet and wisdom of the Prophet. You know, it's a balance that you should have. On the one side, you must be meeting people dealing with people, interacting with people. You cannot isolate yourself. You cannot ignore the social needs. But it's not that with everyone you become very close and you say everything to everyone, share everything with everyone, take everything from everyone. You have to find the balance. I can be very kind and respectful to everyone, but I don't need to mix with everyone. I didn't need to bring everyone to my home or visit everyone his home. <laughs> Rasulullah was careful about people and was safeguarding and protecting himself in the social life, but without showing anything in his face and without doing anything which would alarm people, worry people, 
make them feel they do, are not wanted. So, you don't need to divide people and say, I only meet these people and I don't meet the rest. I only meet, for example, my own community. No. But at the same time, you should have a policy. How close you want to get to people and how close you want people to get to you. وَيَتَفَقَّدُ أَصْحَابَهُ One of the characteristics of the Prophet was that he was asking about his companions. If they were not there for some time, he was asking, where are they? Are they okay? They are in, for example, journey, they are ill. If they were ill, he was going to visit them. So he was asking about his ashab. It's not that because he was very much wanted, he was very busy, he was very popular. He had many, many people in his mosque. Then he was not careful. He was asking about every of his companions. Another thing is that Rasulullah was very strategic in promoting values. Yuhassinu al-hasan wa yuqabbih wa yuqabbihu al-qabih wa yuhinu. If something was good, beautiful, moral, Virtuous Rasulullah was praising and strengthening and promoting. If something was ugly, immoral, vicious, Rasulullah was discouraging and trying to stop it. This is very important because this is the way that day by day, under your <coughs> training, under your instruction, the community can grow. This is a responsibility for all members of the society and community, but especially for the people who have influence and most especially for the leaders. There are other things that Amir al Mumin says, but we don't have time. So I go to the next section, which is about Majlisihi. Sa'altuhu an Majlisihi. How was Rasulullah? when he was gathering people, sitting and talking to them. If Rasulullah had a circle of people around him, how was he behaving? كان صلى الله عليه وآله لا يجلس ولا يقوم إلا على ذكر First of all, Rasulullah was not sitting or standing unless he was remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The beginning and end of his madness was zikr. And of course, everything else was zikr. Maybe he was not, when he was talking to people, always saying subhanallah, alhamdulillah, but everything was an act of remembrance of Allah. But to give a special flavor and a special indication, at least the beginning and end of Madras was something which was directly and explicitly zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, it is recommended when, that when you finish a Madras, you say, Subhan Rabbika Rabbil Izzat Amma Yasakun wa Salamun ala al Mursaleen wa Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alam. So, if you start your madness and end your madness with zikr, this is a sunnah of Rasulullah. Rasulullah was avoiding sitting with his people where can block the way for people. Although there was no traffic regulation at that time, but Rasulullah was very careful not to block the way for other people. Maybe someone wants to pass. We should sit where we are not disturbing or annoying anyone. 
And then he was sitting wherever there was a space. So when people were sitting, Rasulullah was sitting end of their sitting. So he was the person that with him majlis was finishing. He was not going to the first person, to the top necessarily. He was just sitting where was the end of the sitting. This may look uh, you know, not very significant, but it's very, very significant for a messenger that people are very, very respectful to him and he has worldly and spiritual power to be so humble that, first of all, he doesn't have a special, you know, seat to sit, you know, that, you know, a chair or, I don't know, a throne. He sits on the floor with people and he see what way people have sat and just joins them like one of them and look at this beautiful self <laughs> Rasulullah was giving equal attention to every person who was sitting with him. If there were five people, ten people, twenty people, Rasulullah was not just looking at only some of them. You know, it's not easy, you know, sometimes when I was speaking, you know, then after some time, I am worried. Did I look everywhere around equally or not? Or I just looked at some direction more? If it was Rasulullah, he was dividing his glance and look equally to people. And everyone felt that he is very much loved and respected by Rasulullah. To the extent that Amir al says, وَلَا يَحْسَبُ أَحَدٌ مِنْ جُلَسَائِهِ أَنَّ أَحَدًا أَكْرَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ None of the people who were sitting with Rasulullah was thinking that someone in that madras is more respected, more loved by Rasulullah than me. For sure, Rasulullah didn't have the same level of respect for all of them because they were different. They had different qualities, they had different merits. Maybe even among them were some people who were, I don't know, Munafir or whatever. But Rasulullah treated everyone so respectfully that no one felt that I am underprivileged. Someone is favored more by Rasulullah. It's very important. Man jalasahu sabarahu hatta yakuna huwa al-munsarifu. This is also very difficult for someone who is busy, someone who has lots of things to do, who is very much demanded. Whoever was sitting with Rasulullah, Rasulullah was so patient that Rasulullah was not leaving unless that person was leaving. And you know, some people, especially at that time, and they were not very careful about the time after Rasulullah, that okay, we finish this quickly, or only we take his time when it's necessary. They were not very careful. But Rasulullah was so patient. So this person was, you know, sitting and taking his time, and Rasulullah was not rushing them. <laughs> Waiting till that person goes. من سأله حاجة لم يرجع إلا بها أو بميسور من القوم. If someone asked Rasulullah for something, either Rasulullah gave him the same thing, or if it was not possible, at least he did what was possible. At least he said some words to help that person, if he didn't have the means to help that person, or it was not reasonable. But no one 
mentioned any harm to Rasulullah and Rasulullah ignored. قَدْ وَسِعَ النَّاسُ مِنْهُ خُلُقَهُ وَصَارَ لَهُمْ أَبًا People were very comfortable with Rasulullah. They found him very kind and gentle with them. He was a father for them. Rasulullah was not just a good leader, a kind leader. He was like a father that you could tell him whatever you needed. Majlisuhu Majlisu Hilmin Wahayain Wasidin Wa Amana. This is about all people in his majlis. You know, one of the things that we have to learn is that when we are in a gathering where a personality, an alam, a marja, a respected person is present, we have to be very careful because this is his presence, his majlis, his mahla. We have to be very careful. Rasulullah's majlis gathering was in the way that everyone who was there knew that they must be truthful. They must have haya, they must have amana and sidq. It's very beautiful. No one was able to do something against another person, to do ghibah or tohma or tell lies about people or about anything in the presence of Rasulullah. They were very much educated and trained that there is respect for this majlis. They should not raise their voices. They should be very polite and respectful. <laughs> they realize that in the presence of Rasulullah, the elderly members of the community should be respected. The children should be treated with mercy. If Rasulullah was there, no one was ignoring a child crying, a child who needs, for example, you know, care or water, whatever. Or a person with white hair and beard comes and no one respects him, no. If someone had hajjah, they were giving preference to that person. Not that they sit next to Rasulullah and don't let anyone else to get to Rasulullah. Actually, they were giving priority to people who have need. Someone needs to ask questions, someone needs guidance, someone needs money, whatever. They were giving preference to the people who have need. If there was a stranger, someone who was not from Medina, for example, they were giving him protection, they were helping him. Not that because no one knows him, no one is going to ask for him, you know, we ignore him. If someone is a stranger, if someone is a refugee, we have to help them. Then, Imam Muslim alayhi salam says, I asked my father about siratuhu fi julasahi. How was he treating the people who were in his gatherings, in his presence? Rasulullah was always seen while he has you know, kind, a smile on his face. He was not looking at people with anger or with, you know, worries or, you know, with, you know, suspicious look. This is one of the characters of movement, that movement, Bushruhu fi wajhe wa huznuhu fi qalbi. 
people should see joy in your face and your grief should be in your heart. If someone is very close to you and really has to know about your problem, you can tell him. But not that when you go out, everyone on the street knows that you have a problem. When you go out, people should think that you have no problem at all. In this way, give energy to other people. Bushroom fi wa husnum fi It's about moment. And Rasulullah was the best example. Kana daim al he was always appearing with happy face, a smile. Sahla al khulq. He was very lenient, very flexible, very gentle. Layyan al jani. He was very humble, very easy to deal. Laysa bi fazlin. He was not harsh. Although Rasulullah was in a society and a time that mercy was not taken positively. You know that in that society, mercy was a sign of weakness. When Rasulullah kissed <coughs> one of his grandchild, grandchildren, one of these people said, I have never kissed my children. Can you imagine a man has never kissed his children? in all his life. This cannot be by accident. <laughs> this means that this was a habit. If you kiss your children, it's a weakness. In that society, Rasulullah was so kind, so merciful, so gentle, and he is so much pumped, Rahman, to that society that changed them to the extent that they become Ruhama of Bayna. They were dying for each other. But unfortunately, when Rasulullah was no longer with them, some people went back to the akhlaq of Jahili. So, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, You have become gentle with people because of mercy of Allah. Amir al Mu'min says, Rasulullah Makana Fadlan, he was not harsh. He was very kind, very gentle. Yatagafalu Amma La Yashtahi. I wish we had time to go, you know, very carefully all of this one by one. I have to rush. Yatagafalu Amma La Yashtahi. If there is something that he doesn't like, he ignores. If it is not haram, if it is not bid'ah, he ignores. For example, they bring a food that he doesn't like. He wouldn't say, I don't like this food. Who made this food? You could make it better. Next time, you know, make it better. No. He was ignoring. Yataqafal is different from yaqful. Yaqful means you are heedless. Means that you don't understand. You don't pay attention. But yataqafal means you pretend that you didn't understand. So if someone said something rude to Rasulullah, if someone did something which was not good to Rasulullah, to his person, to his taste, he was pretending that he didn't notice. No one went to Rasulullah with a hope and expectation and then came back while he was dispersed. And inshallah, I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us access to Rasulullah inshallah on the day of judgment. Because if we get access to Rasulullah inshallah, he will not make us dispersed. His shafa, inshallah, will save us. But we have to make sure that, inshallah, we reach Rasulullah. La yuqiya sumin. And now you can imagine how is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If his servant, if his messenger is this, no one was disappointed and despaired. 
لا يخيبوا فيه مؤملي The people who went with hope to him, they were never disappointed. You know, Karim takes it for himself as a crime to disappoint people. People who are not Karim, people who are mean, they calculate. Do they owe you or not? If they owe you and there's no way to run away, they may give you. If they don't owe you, they say, I don't owe you. Or if they have given you a few times, I have given you a few times, why you come again? But Karim is not like this. When people have hope in Karim, Karim thinks this is death. You have come all the way to my home, to me. It's impossible that I send you back. This is the manners of people who are caring. And if you treat people like this, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala certainly will treat you better. So let us treat each other with honor and respect and dignity and leave the calculator in your office, not in your relation with your community, with your family, with your friends. Just karam, just honor, respect, dignity. Rasulullah had left three things and kept them away from himself. And he refrained from three things. Al Mira. He was not debating with people. He was not fighting and arguing and quarreling. Mira is very bad. Even if you are right, Rahimallahum ra an taraka al mira awalu kana muhiqa. Even if you are right, don't do mira. What is mira? To argue and argue and argue. You raise your point, you mention your point once, twice, maximum three times. If the other person doesn't accept, leave it. Especially in family, husband, wife, father, child. Neighbors, don't keep discussing, 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 because as you see, always it becomes worse. People need one, two, three times clarification. After that, become just insisting on your point. And it becomes more difficult. It's like when your tire is stuck in the snow and you accelerate. It goes deeper and deeper. So if it doesn't solve the problem, after two, three times, leave it for another time. If it's really needed, if it's something, just forget it. If it's something urgent, something important, when again everything is cool, no stress, no anger, no anxiety, you can discuss it. Rasulullah was not doing mera. Well, ikthar, he was not doing anything in excess, especially talking. And he was not dealing with the things which were not, which are not important for him. He also made sure he doesn't do three things with respect to people. He was not blaming anyone. To blame people is not good. Sometimes, in a very rare cases, as an educator, you may need to mention that this is a problem, but not blame them. You know, if you see there is a problem in me, if you see, for example, there is a dirt on my face or on my dress, you can kindly mention. But if you blame me, it's not good. It's not helpful. It's not respectful. We should not blame anyone. Even bad people, don't blame them because you may also become like them or even worse. Just try to help everyone with love and respect. Rasulullah was not blaming. 
ولا يطلب عورته ولا عثراته رسول الله was not looking for the secrets of people or for the mistakes of people we have to be like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sattar al we must cover people instead of disclosing their secrets and problems if we are followers of Rasulullah <coughs> and then Amir al <coughs> says when Rasulullah was talking he was talking in the way that people who were there they were very attentive to the extent that Amir al says كَأَنَّمَا عَلَى رُؤُوسِهِمُ الطَّيْرَ This is a proverb in Arabic but it makes sense in every language you know when a bird is on your head and you don't want the bird to fly you don't move you don't turn when Rasulullah was talking People were listening so attentively to Rasulullah. And Alhamdulillah, they didn't have mobile or anything to distract them. <laughs> but also the beauty of the words of Rasulullah. I don't know, people of our age also would be the same if Rasulullah talks or not. But in that time, it was like this. As if bird was on their head. They were not moving, they were just listening to Rasulullah. وَإِذَا سَكَتَ تَكَلَّمُوا When Rasulullah was silent, then they were talking. Not that when Rasulullah was talking, they were talking. They were listening. And when any person in that gathering was also talking, they were listening. Those who were in the presence of Rasulullah, they were listening to each other. When one person was talking, everyone was listening. And look at this beautiful. Everything is first beautiful. When there was something that people were laughing and smiling, Rasulullah was also smiling. If there was something that people were surprised, he was showing that he's surprised. You know, he was acting like one of them. He didn't let any unnecessary gap to be created. Of course, he is Rasulullah, no one is like him. But he was not letting an atmosphere of fear or even awe and you know, haiba to be created between him and people. He was treating in the way that they felt very, very comfortable with him. And then finally, I go to the last part. Imam Hussein alayhi salam says, I asked my father about the silence of Rasulullah. Sa'altuhu an sukut Rasulullah. How was the silence of Rasulullah? Then Amir al Mu'minin said, Kana sukutuhu ala arba. His silence had four dimensions. Ala al hilm, wa al hadar, wa al taqdeer, wa al tafkir. His silence was a matter of forbearance, a matter of measuring. A matter of contemplation and a matter of alertness. It's not that he was silent, means he was not doing anything and he was just wasting his time. No. His silence was a matter of forbearance, alertness, contemplation, and measuring. Ahmad Taqdeer, he's measuring. What was Rasulullah measuring when he was silent? Even when he was silent, he was measuring how much to look at each person and listen to them. So he was active listener. And he was listening to everyone with measure. So it's not that he was just you know, taking some rest when he was silent. 
عما تفكره فيما يبقى ويفنى his contemplation was about what is going to remain what is going to perish what is worldly and what is a spiritual what is going to benefit soon and then finish what is going to have long term impact Rasulullah was thinking prioritizing allocating different amount of attention and significance <coughs> And he was patient. He had helm and sabr, forbearance and patience. كان لا يغضبه شيء ولا يستفزه. Nothing was able to make Rasulullah angry unless he himself decided to show reaction. You know, كان لا يغضبه شيء. Amir al said, no one was able to, and nothing was able to make Rasulullah angry. If someone was rude, if someone was, I don't know, polite, if Rasulullah was in rush, he was not getting angry. It's a very good character. If you don't let people to provoke you, or anything to provoke you, you have control over your emotions, you keep calm, because this is the way that you can make good decisions. If you are angry, you cannot make good decisions. And his alertness was <clears throat> that he was trying to always do good things so that people would follow him to leave aside anything which was not moral so that people refrain from it. He was trying to exercise the best discerning for the interest of Ummah and to do what can bring good of dunya and akhirah for Ummah. This is a beautiful account of conduct of Rasulullah by Amir al-Mu'minin mentioned by Imam Hussein salam, and Sunni and Shia have mentioned this. We are very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for showing us Rasulullah and enabling us to follow him. But we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please complete your ni'mah by giving us a strength and determination to truly follow him. We know him and we follow him in our doctrines, but we want to follow him, inshallah, in every aspect of our life. Since it's the also night of the martyrdom of Imam Hassan al I just read quickly a few couplets about Imam Hassan You know Imam Hassan 